day, everyone. My name is Rebecca Lilly with the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Recent Developments in Commercial Nuclear Energy. We are grateful to our moderator, Isabella Rubel, and our distinguished speakers for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International and U.S. Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organi organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations along with a host of other products and services you can find at our website at iaee.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for the panelists, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window and type your questions. We've allocated time at the end of the webinar to read and answer them. And now I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Isabella Rubel. Isabella, over to you. Good morning. I would like to extend like a warm welcome to our speakers and to our audience. Good morning to those in the US, good afternoon, and good night to those in Japan where it is around midnight right now. In recent years, we have seen a substantial increase in the interest for nuclear energy. The reasons for this increased demand by communities, utilities, and businesses stems from the many advantages that nuclear energy brings, such as it's a clean source of energy. It's highly reliable 24 seven, all year round. And in situations such as extreme weather or a pandemic, it's totally reliable. It provides energy security and independence. New generation nuclear reactors have additional advantages such as increased flexibility, lower amounts of spent nuclear fuel produced and much more. In today's webinar, we will hear about some of the lessons learned so far um, and how they can be used to expedite the deployment of nuclear reactors and satisfy the increased demand for clean and reliable nuclear. With this being said, I turn it over to our first speaker, Nobuo Tanaka. Please go ahead. Thank you, Isabella. Let, let me start sharing the screen. Can you see my screen? It takes yes. some time yes. to start. Yes. It's starting, okay? Yes. Okay. I I was the executive director of the IEA, International Energy Agency, some time ago. It was created for the oil shock in 1974. It's 50 years since it uh, started. We release stockpile of oil for the sake of energy security. The, the most recent one is the Ukraine situation. When I was executive director, I did release for the uh, Libyan crisis. It's uh, not only oil, but it's an energy crisis as such. Um, one of the interesting experience I did has with uh, Angela Merkel in his chance in her chancellery. We discuss about the nuclear and energy policy with. German industrial leaders. And I asked her the question, why Germany is not serious about nuclear? She said, I am scientist. I know very well about nuclear and how important it is, but to do nuclear in Germany, give me votes. So she is, she's not a scientist, but she's a very wise uh, politician. Um, but uh, because of her, uh, let's say, uh, phasing out of the nuclear after Fukushima accident and relying too much uh, on uh, gas from Russia, she created a huge catastrophe in a geopolitical sense. So the political leader's decision is very important for the sake of energy sustainability and security. IEA says recently the net zero by 
2050 and surprise OPEC and oil majors. It's I a shock because uh, uh, it says we don't need any new oil and gas development uh, at this moment if net zero 2050 happens. And this year it surprised again that uh, all the fossil fuels may reach the demand peak very soon. Oil, natural gas, not only coal. So this again is a huge shock for the energy security. Um, Putin's mistake is he may have invaded Ukraine before these peaks happen and uh, uh, Russia suffered. So this kind of uh, security is a top issue for all the countries, but Japan, Korea uh, do not have any oil and gas and importing oil. So security for the energy, the nuclear's role is very, very important. And uh, winners and losers in the game of crisis of oil, uh, energy and uh, sustainability of climate, you know, there are, I mean, Russia is definitely a loser. While US with the Inflation Reduction Act and Europe with Repower EU could be a very strong winner. China, India try to be a renewable energy superpower. Saudi Arabia may succeed CCS or solar power. Japan, Korea, we need hydrogen, we need sustainable nuclear. And uh, we think, as uh, Isabel said, uh, IEA's yeah, uh, recent report says more nuclear, uh, it's a very important role for ensuring rapid and secure energy transition. And the cost of nuclear is cheap when it is operating nuclear site. Building the new one is very costly, unfortunately, because of the the, 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 the difficulty after Fukushima of the safety regulation. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida an announced to restart 17 reactors by the end of this year. Well, 12 is already now. Uh, can we do the five? Probably very difficult, but very ambitious target is set. Um, IEA is what well, uh, net zero by 2050 shows that we need to double the, uh, the nuclear capacity. Uh, by 2050. But uh, this COP28, a couple of days ago, announced that uh, more than 20 countries agreed to triple nuclear capacity by 2050. The NEA's uh, uh, prospect shows that if um, uh, ambitious projections happen, it could be uh, triple. But certainly, can we really triple this uh, capacity is a really challenging one because when we see the, the transition of energy from coal to oil, oil to natural gas, and then renewables, nuclear's uh, performance was very, very poor, unfortunately. What's, why, why, why that's the case? That one of the reasons is the cost overrun in many of the big reactors in Okiluoto, Flamanville, and Vogel, so the cost went too high, the Areva collapsed, uh, uh, Westinghouse collapsed, and uh, also Toshiba collapsed. So the, the, the issue of the cost of the nuclear is not the size of the reactor, but it's a more the modularity or standardization is the issue. So I sincerely hope that small modular reactor is becoming reality and make it a, a uh, futures, uh, let's say, uh, of the nuclear power in a commercial sense. In the ICEF, Innovation Coolers Forum, the George is also the, the steering committee member, discuss about the nuclear future. And uh, we say that small modular reactor with passive safety or radioactive waste disposal or proliferation registers, especially under the current uh, geopolitical situation, these are the necessary conditions to, 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 to match the socio-political sustainability of the commercial nuclear power. And uh, I created the, in the Canon Institute of Global Study to discuss about the future of the nuclear only with the women we are who are related to the nuclear or who are the financials etc and get the conclusion that we have to minimize the risk after the fukushima that sustainability condition is very important to to make a commercial reactors feasible and risk minimization uh, and uh, radioactive waste uh, and also contribution to the nuclear non-proliferation is the key element 
And uh, I think that the flexible nuclear technology, which is small scale, but uh, but uh, could be operated uh, flexibly and deployed flexibly, these are the necessary conditions. And there are good examples already with uh, integral fast reactor or Okro, or Dow Chemical X Energy, or even these smaller type of the reactors may have a very interesting chance because uh, this uh, IFR, Integral Fast Reactor of the Idaho National Laboratory is a very uh, it's a closed uh, metallic field, closed the cycle fast reactor with pyro processing. And this is proven to be the uh, 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 say safe and uh, passive safety is proven in experiment already. And transuranic disposal is very much easier because uh, uh, separating mine actinide together and burn it with plutonium and, and make the final waste as a matter of 300 years rather than 300,000 years. 300 years is very long, but much easier uh, to, to find the final disposal site. And for Japan, this is a cr crucial element to make the, uh, the, the total system of the nuclear sustainable. And this technology can be applied to the, in, uh, to the Fukushima's uh, uh, accidents and debris. Debris should be treated somehow uh, uh, in Fukushima because it cannot be transported out of the Fukushima prefecture to somewhere else. So it should be done there by this technology and reduce the toxicity and can be stored uh, at 300 years there. And uh, Fukui prefecture, another part of Japan with rich nuclear sites, are uh, considering to build this kind of reactor to reduce the spent fuel or waste. Um, Japanese government moved toward the more advanced system and this fast reactor with pyro processing is one of the options. One of the issues for the nuclear is the, 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 the weaponization. And I participated this G7 summit, uh, G8, summit in uh, 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 L'Aquila, uh, which is the first Obama's participation and Gaddafi was there. Unfortunately, after this, uh, let's say, uh, the Obama administration uh, intro, uh, invaded in, in Libya and, and eliminated Gaddafi. And that was a very bad mistake and gave a terrible message to Kim Jong-un. And uh, President Trump, penalize Iran, which do not have weapon, while make hands, shake hands with North Korea who has weapon. And this is sending a horrible message to the non-weapon state because weaponization is good for the diplomacy. And another mistake by Putin of using the threatening the Ukraine with, who, do, who return the nuclear uh, missiles to Russia with possible use of the uh, uh, nuclear missile. And this is a horrible again. And uh, there's a risk of the Chinese president's Taiwan case. And also the current uh, Gaza, Hamas, uh, uh, Israel uh, say, uh, conflict shows the risk of nuclear weapons. So nuclear weaponization must be uh, treated. Uh, otherwise, this uh, NPT is in a deep problem. So I think uh, Japan, Korea, and the United States should have a more geopolitical leadership on the nuclear power. That is one of the, another issue which I want to mention. This uh, integral fast reactor development is the one. The Korea is very strong interest in using this technology for pyroprocessing, et cetera. And developing nuclear propulsion submarine for Japan, Korea, and US. This is a Northeast Asian AUKUS. Another one is to, to denuclearize North Korea by using the, their plutonium and uranium by Japan and Korea. And this kind of uh, diplomacy may lead us to the new uh, non-proliferation frame by using the uh, treaty of prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, there are 60 potential or 50 nuclear uh, weapon potential states but uh, to reduce that number of the real weapon states, I think uh, proliferation uh, 
regime is not enough. We have to, Japan and Korea should announce to join the, the, this uh, treaty of uh, nuclear weapon ban and uh, I engage other countries like Iran or Saudi Arabia uh, or uh, you know these countries to come together. And because and and some of these non-weapon states should be given the, for example, the permanent seat in the UN Security Council, which is currently monopolized by the weapon states. So this kind of unfair treatment of non-weapon states creating the risk of proliferation much, much uh, possible in, in, in the coming future. So I sincerely hope that the global community must deal with this weaponization issues. Otherwise, commercial utilization may be very difficult. Um, nuclear fusion may come. ISAF we discussed and the uh, Department of Energy came to say that maybe fusion may be at the inflection point. So any and Commonwealth fusion may uh, make it possible in the early part of uh, 2030s. And some Japanese uh, uh, company called Helical Fusion say 2034 is a target year. So if uh, small, small modular reactors are not really moved fast, maybe fusion may take over. So this kind of uh, challenge is uh, very interesting. We have to take care of the political leaders take, with global identity, must take more active role to stop the risk of uh, nuclear war uh, as, as uh, in reality. And I, ISAF was created by uh, Prime Minister Abe, and he was one of the very unique Japanese uh, political leader with global identity, and I, I miss him a lot. Well, I stopped here, and, and I really appreciate uh, that you gave me the opportunity to talk about uh, the nuclear idea from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nobuo. This was amazing. So much information in just 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, hope we can all digest that. And uh, please let me uh, turn it over to Erika Bigford from the US Department of Energy. Erika, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, we are. Yes. Yes. All right, great. Uh, so uh, as you can see from the great uh, comprehensive presentation before, there's a lot of uh, ideas and possibilities going on in the area of commercial nuclear. Um, among them, lots of interest in the potential of advanced reactors, uh, micro reactors, you know, possibly fusion. Uh, but in, in the course in the United States, at least, uh, in these discussions with policymakers and others about uh, pursuing new nuclear, uh, facilities, uh, one of the first questions that comes up is what about the waste? Um, and so when you think about uh, nuclear power, uh, one of the long running ch challenges and concerns, not necessarily from a, a technology standpoint, but certainly from a public, public trust and confidence standpoint, is management of the spent nuclear fuel that's produced by nuclear power generation. So that's the area uh, that my program is responsible. I'm at the US Department of Energy and the Office of of nuclear energy. I'm the director of the Office of Integrated Waste Management, and we are pursuing solutions to uh, ensure that the U.S. spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste inventory is safely and securely disposed of and, uh, you know, to protect people in the environment over the long term. So just a little context uh, about the U.S., uh, just because this is a, you know, international audience, and I didn't want to assume that everybody has a full picture. Uh, so in the U.S., we began using commercial nuclear power in 1958. Uh, today, we have 93 operating commercial reactors, uh, soon to be 94, with Vogel Unit 4 coming online sometime next year. 20 nuclear power uh, reactors have shut down completely at this point and are on various stages of decommissioning. And we have more than 90,000 metric tons of spent nuclear fuel around the country, the vast majority of which is stored at the reactor sites where it was generated. By 2075, which is the projected uh, future uh, lifetime of our existing nuclear reactor fleets operations, we estimate that our complete spent nuclear fuel inventory will be 140,000 metric tons. And as you can see from the image on the screen, uh, it's a large. The U.S. is a large country um, with a lot of these sites uh, spread out. 
So any location or locations where we uh, store or manage consult do consolidated storage or disposal of this material will involve a fair amount of uh, transversing other jurisdictions, which historically has been among the challenges for getting these facilities sited and operational. So in our program, in starting in 2021 and continuing for the last two years, and we expect also uh, the upcoming funding year, uh, Congress directed our office to pursue siting consolidated interim storage facilities to consolidate the spent nuclear fuel to one or one or more small, fewer sites, uh, and to do this do, using a consent-based siting process. And this consent-based siting process was proposed by uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, um, which was commissioned by President Obama back in 2010 and produced their final report in 2012 uh, with a number of recommendations for how to move the, the nuclear waste program in the U.S. forward. Uh, unfortunately, there's been some lag time in enacting any of those policies or uh, uh, action being taken, and we're just starting to see uh, some action being taken with moving forward and consolidated interim storage. I do want to note, though, that uh, that doesn't uh, remove the need for long-term disposal and having deep geologic repositories for long-term disposal. This is moving for interim storage is seen as the first step um, and many more steps need to come. So this is our vision for an integrated waste management system uh, where in the U.S. we have both the commercial spent nuclear fuel and then we also have other high-level waste from legacy reprocessing activities as well as defense activities. Our near-term focus is on moving the commercial spent nuclear fuel to one or more federal consolidated interim storage facilities, uh, and then eventually having geologic repositories for the long-term disposal, and the high-level waste would uh, go to the repository with the spent nuclear fuel. Uh, the situation in the U.S. is a little unique compared to some other countries. Other countries, say Finland, uh, Sweden, Canada, uh, do not have consolidated interim storage. They are moving directly to repositories. Uh, there's different circumstances in different countries. Uh, for example, Switzerland and the Netherlands do do consolidated interim storage, so it's a little bit dependent on the country situation. In the U.S., the benefits we see of consolidated interim storage is one, it's, it's more of a near-term solution. The timeline for getting an interim storage facility up and running is more in the order of 10 to 15 years, whereas a repository is probably 30 to 40 years. Uh, so it's about sort of what can we do in the in the near to medium term while we also continue uh, to push for progress for the long term. It allows us to clear uh, reactor sites so that they don't continue storing the fuel on the reactor sites. In some cases, it becomes a little bit of a space management issue. Uh, but additionally, in the U.S., uh, the unique circumstance we have is the fuel owners, the utilities entered into contracts with the department for the department to begin accepting spent nuclear fuel. The date that that was supposed to happen was determined by Congress to be in January 1998. Because we have not yet had a facility available to accept that material, the government has been determined to be in partial breach of contract and the fuel owners have been suing the government uh, since that date. And in total, more than $10 billion has been paid out in taxpayer money as a result of those lawsuits. So by moving into interim storage in the near term, the government could take title to the fuel, and then the, the, that litigation would end saving the taxpayer money. For our consent-based siting process, uh, we began an effort in about 2015 uh, for consent-based siting for a few years. Then we had a change in, in administration and policy, and then started back up again in 2021. Uh, earlier this year, we published a revised consent-based siting process focused on federal interim storage. It includes the recommendations from the 2012 Blue Ribbon Commission report. Uh, it also has public uh, takes into account public comment that we've received from various public meetings, uh, public comment periods, requests for information, um, and just lessons learned and best practices from the US um, and abroad as well. It has three main stages in our consent-based siting process. Uh, our goal is to find willing and informed communities who will agree to enter into negotiated hosting agreements to host these facilities for many decades. And so the first stage is about building uh, capacity to engage in these discussions. In the US, the average American probably does not interact much with nuclear technology or think about spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste management systems. And so during the first phase, our goal is to kind of kickstart a national conversation, um, which relates to pursuit of these advanced reactors, uh, as well as 
the waste worms that may come out with them, intergenerational responsibility, um, and you know what determines consent and a number of factors. So that's the phase we're currently working on. It's kind of further developing the process and how we'll roll it out and seek volunteers to consider siting a facility. We're very much building on the successful models that we've seen in Canada and Sweden with these kind of voluntary siting processes. Stage two of our consent-based siting, so that's a future stage, we'll plan to put out, uh, establish some basic criteria um, for what kind of site characteristics uh, we're looking for. Uh, for consolidated interim storage, it's much, much lower barrier um, in terms of site suitability as compared to a repository. Uh, really, you need sufficient land area, uh, flat land, uh, some connectivity to transportation infrastructure in the US. We're primarily planning to use rail um, and, and things like that. And so we plan to put out some initial criteria and seek volunteers who wish to engage in a process to be considered for hosting. And we envision that process to have many on-ramps and off-ramps um, for communities to decide if they wanna pursue, continue pursuing the process or if um, they decide it's not the right fit for them. And then the last stage is uh, entering into a negotiated hosting agreement, licensing the facility and constructing and operating the facility. So it's a, it's a long running process, again, on the order of 10 to 15 years, uh, but based on you know, facilities that have been successful, both in the US and elsewhere, we think this is the model that has the best chance of, of succeeding in today's uh, environment. In support of our consent-based siting activities, I have on the screen here, this is Secretary Granholm, uh, Jennifer Granholm, the Secretary of Energy right now. Uh, we were pleased to have her announce awardees for our consent-based siting consortia awards. We put out a funding opportunity last year uh, to solicit uh, applicants to support this development of the consent-based siting process and to inform the rollouts and, and conduct of this process and the discussions and considerations. Uh, so we have placed 12 awards, um, total funding at $24 million, so about $2 million per award, and they'll uh, be operating for two years uh, and then provide feedback to our process. So around the end of that process is when we're going to be looking towards the next phase of going out and seeking volunteers. And so we expect the work that they do to, to strongly inform the approach that we take in, in the next stage. On the map on the screen, uh, on the left are all the primary awardees um, from this funding opportunity. Uh, they have many partners and communities that they plan to engage with. So the map on the right shows uh, in the green dots, that's where the primary awardees are. Um, and then kind of the blue pins is where their partners are located or where the communities they plan to engage with. Some of them are going to be speaking to existing communities that have existing nuclear facilities, understanding what their thoughts and considerations are for hosting nuclear facilities in their community, um, going to uh, indigenous communities, uh, rural communities and others to try and get, uh, you know, as much input as we can from a variety uh, of, of American communities and how this process can move forward and be successful. The reason that we went with this um, funding opportunity approach is, is uh, multiple reasons, one of which is to be a force multiplier. Uh, the United States is more than 330 million people. So while ideally we would be able to have, you know, kitchen conversation, kitchen table conversations with most Americans, unfortunately, we just don't have the uh, the personnel to support that. And so the idea is by putting out these funding opportunities, funding these organizations that they can go out um, and then speak with many communities. And then we have a broader reach than just the department alone would be able to. Additionally, in the US, there are many people who do not have trust in government. So by using awardees that may be academic institutions or community groups or uh, industry or other types um, of organizations, uh, they may be able to have more fruitful conversations with certain communities than the government alone would be able to. We also envision these awardees to potentially support development of cohorts um, or uh, to continue engaging with this issue through the process. So as they go through this first phase of funding, they'll be learning and developing you know, expertise that then they can potentially make available um, to communities that may be interested in pursuing hosting a facility down the line, not just relying on information from the government, but having uh, third party experts that they can rely on or seek information from. So again, uh, it's a three phase. Uh, process for consent-based siting. We're currently in stage one where we're building capacity uh, to engage on this issue. And then in the future, next phases, we plan to seek volunteers and then pursue negotiating a hosting agreement and uh, operating the facility.
If you want to find out more information, we have a snazzy QR code up here, and you can go to our website and read more about our consent-based sighting activities. Thank you, Erica. That was very enlightening. Um, so um, our next speaker is Georg Erdmann. Please, Georg, over to you. Thank you very much, Isabella. Uh, I'm happy to be here. In spite of my message is uh, very simple and I have therefore no slides. Uh, to my person, I was professor at the Berlin University of Technology, a professor for energy systems. And before I was there, I was in Switzerland at the uh, Paul Scherer Institute, which is the Swiss nuclear research institution. And during my stay at that institution, I got an idea that I will communicate to you today. And the key message is uh, that wrong regulation in Europe killed nuclear industry here. Uh, as uh, Nobu uh, uh, showed us before, it was uh, Chancellor Merkel who said, give me the votes in order to build new nuclear power stations. And many people assume that it is the acceptance of the population which killed nuclear power. And uh, my thesis is a little bit different. I say it was wrong regulation which killed. Why? In my period when I was at the Paul Scherer Institute, I had a good colleague, um, uh, which was called, what is called Walter Seifritz, professor. And he led a group working on small nuclear reactors. And his idea was uh, quite convincing, at least to me. I don't know whether it is technical, physical. I'm not a nuclear physicist. But his idea was to build nuclear reactors so small that you can uh, transport them below the bridges of the highways. So that means you can uh, build a facility in, in which you produce all the nuclear reactors, maybe because they are the capacity of these nuclear are very small, that you, you need several units in order to have the same capacity of a big nuclear reactor. Then these uh, reactors should be so small that they could be transported uh, to any site via the highway system in Europe. Uh, I think this was a brilliant idea, and we discussed a little bit of the, about this idea. Of course, I cannot explain the nuclear why this could work or why it could not work because I'm no, not not nuclear physicist. But I can tell you why this uh, project was killed. The, this project was killed uh, in the 90s, and even uh, Walter Seifritz he he lost his job at the Paul Scherer Institute because it urged the, the, the people to, to do more research on this direction and he would not do something else. So why he was killed? He was, uh, um, his project was killed because if this technology would work, the regulation in Switzerland and also the regulation in Germany says you are not allowed to use nuclear technology except the most advanced type of this technology. Usually, if you, you, you buy a car, this car must uh, satisfy all the regulations when it was uh, put into uh, license, if it is licensed. But once it is licensed, it, you can use the car as long as he, he runs. But with nuclear, it's a different type. You must, if there is a new improved nuclear technology, all the existing nuclear power stations it be, must be phased out because they are not anymore the most advanced nuclear technology. So as uh, Walter Seifritz wanted to establish a most advanced nuclear technology, uh, this was a challenge to the existing nuclear power station in Switzerland. At that time, we had four nuclear power stations in Switzerland. One of them is now uh, phased out, uh, shut off. So we have actually three nuclear power stations which are still expected to run for another 20 years, at least. So that means if this, uh, this idea of small nuclear reactors would work, the Seifritz idea, they had to be shut off and the, immediately the industry has to build new nuclear power stations. So the old capacity or the old technology, which is expensive, had to be in write off. And so this is, the, the most important, uh, one, 
one, uh, my idea or one, uh, my observation, uh, if you have a too ambitious regulation in, in a technology, it can kill the advancement of this technology because the existing nuclear uh, power stations would lose its license once if a more advanced technology would be available on the market. So mm, no people who have in the, uh, invested in nuclear technology would like to have this more advanced nuclear technology. They prefer to use the old nuclear technology. And uh, since uh, the 90s, though that means 30 years ago, there was a project in Switzerland which tried to develop um, more uh, a new form of nuclear technology, the small nuclear reactor, which today many people talk about, uh, but still we don't have this technology available. Um, but uh, at that time, it was, it, there was a technology. And of course, we don't know what is the, the option of this, but the traditional way nuclear technology developed in Europe was to make the, the systems bigger, bigger, and bigger, because if uh, uh, they are not big enough, then uh, the security equipment would not be economic. The, 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 the requirements for security equipment of a new nuclear power station are more uh, demanding. So that means you can only invest in the nuclear power station if you have a very big nuclear station. Instead of making small, where maybe the demand of nuclear safety is not the same as important because the ex possibility of a nuclear accident is smaller. So um, uh, therefore, this, this, um, this technology is now bigger. And today, the industry in Germany, in Europe, and in, in Germany, of course, we knew, you know, the, the, the last nuclear reactor was, was uh, three, last three nuclear reactors had been closed down in, in April this year. So Germany has no nuclear power stations, actually. Switzerland has still three nuclear power stations, but when you talk with the industry, uh, the, the industry says, we don't want to build another nuclear power station because they are too expensive, because they are, the equipment is too complex and uh, the investment costs are too high. So uh, the, the, at, at, at the moment, we don't see um, a, a strategy uh, for, for running nuclear industry uh, after 20, 30, I don't know, uh, when the existing nuclear power stations are, uh, are dying out. Um, I, uh, I will end with um, replying to one of the questions in the chat from Peter Hartley. Uh, Peter Hartley said, um, 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 of course, we have an, uh, new power systems in all over the world. We want to have more flexible power uh, equipment, uh, uh, generation equipment, namely wind power and photovoltaics. And how does it make sense to uh, go into nuclear, which is uh, uh, difficult to run in a flexible way? Yes, that is I, as I have understood the question of Peter Hartley. So if you have a flexible system in the generation, you need a, as a backup system, also a flexible system. And uh, the, the problem is, of course, uh, uh, the, as we, we know, any flexible system, uh, if it is not fossil fuel based, is relatively expensive because maybe the year has 8,630 hours. Um, uh, and if you can run nuclear power station or any other type of explosion, only 2,000 hours per year, the, the capital costs per unit are very high. So that means as we have, what are the alternatives for, for the existing system, wind and uh, for the, we need, as we cannot invest into fossil fuel technologies, every, every alternative, every, every other uh, option are also all the other options are also very capital intensive. You need mostly capital. So that means we have no alternative to go if we want to get rid of fossil fuels to, to use capital intensive technologies. So I don't think the argument of economics is really hurting nuclear. Of course, it is hurting if nuclear is too expensive. But if small nuclear reactors are relatively cheap compared to uh, batteries or 
uh, the technology of, of uh, electrolysis of of, um, of hydro hydrogen or whatsoever. These are all very capital intensive technologies. And if nuclear is not more expensive together with all the other costs of uh, garbage, et cetera, then uh, nuclear has a chance in the future. To my view, this is the economic answer to, to this nuclear uh, option. But we need cheaper nuclear technology. The, the present uh, path to make nuclear reactors bigger, 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 uh, which uh, the last uh, reactors in, in, in Europe uh, um, uh, they have a capacity of 1,600 uh, uh, megawatt and they cost 13, uh, th uh, 20 billion euros. It's clear that this is not feasible for a, uh, for a power system. Then uh, all other alternatives for backing up uh, wind and, and uh, solar would be better. So thank you very much for this, um, uh, uh, for, for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Georg. This was uh, very enlightening again about, you know, technology and what hampers, you know, its deployment or its development. Um, so with this being said, thank you. And I will um, hand it over to Jack, who I guess will further, uh, you know, talk, tell us about, you know, what other impediments are there for nuclear development and deployment. Thank you, Jack. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Isabel. It's really a pleasure to be here and with this panel. I, I don't feel worthy, but I'm going to go ahead and say my piece anyway. So uh, I want to start off by saying two things very clearly. One, I'm very pro-nuclear. Two, I'm very optimistic about the future of nuclear energy. Now, I say this up front because you might question this after I say what I'm about to say. I'm going to make the argument that the only way that we will ever have a truly innovative economical and competitive, at least American nuclear energy industry, is to get the federal government as far away from it as possible. This means get rid of the subsidies, get rid of the financing. We need to rethink regulation, get government out of nuclear waste management. We need what some might call radical reform. Now, I wouldn't call it that because I think it's pretty basic stuff. We need to build something that people want for a price that they're willing to pay and th then build more of them. I get it though, people think nuclear is different. Government has to have a role, they say. I say, does it? Well, sure, there's a regulatory role for sure. But the government has some role, doesn't mean that government needs to have its current role. The reason's pretty simple. Governments aren't good at business. They're good at other things. I'll give them that, but they're not good at business. They're not good at commercialization. They have different interests and different motivations. And frankly, they're spending other people's money. And bureaucrats and politicians just don't have skin in the game. And you need that skin in the game in order to make the decisions that will yield the sort of industry that we want to see. So why does everyone think government needs to be so involved? We'll point out risk. So let's look at risk for a little bit. There is financial risk for sure. We've already heard about it. But that's the case with any big project. And frankly, it's relative. We have a lot of big companies and rich people who are out there wanting to build big energy projects. And they do build big energy projects. So it can't just be financial risk. We see these sorts of things being built without government directing the capital. There's technological risk. Sure, that's there. But like financial risk, I don't really see nuclear's different from anything else. In fact, one could argue that the technical risk is pretty low. I mean, we know how to build and operate nuclear reactors. It's been done literally a thousand times. Sure, there's technological risk with new designs and such, but that doesn't seem out of the realm of what naturally occurs with lots of businesses. There's always technological risk when you're pushing the boundaries forward. And then there's political risk. Now, this is the big one. It's the one that drives all the others as far as I'm concerned. And if there is a justification for government intervention, it's because it's a way to mitigate the risk that government itself imposes. And we've already heard a little bit about that. But here's the problem with that. Every time government intervenes to mitigate a risk that it has created, it just creates another level of risk. And worse, it creates dependence. It distorts capital flows. It incentivizes rent seeking and lobbying. 
It forces firms to spend some amount of time, often a lot of their time, on working on things that satisfy politicians and bureaucrats rather than on what markets want. It creates misalignments between responsibility and authorities. It undermines economic efficiency. And it doesn't necessarily, I would argue it often doesn't, reward the technologies that best meet the market where the market currently is. And it changes all the time. It's just an absolutely horrible way to build any industry, and it will always fail. You might get a reactor or two, and you might even keep a couple of, you might keep a few firms above water but you won't get anything resembling a robust, competitive, innovative nuclear industry. So I know, okay, Jack, you're so smart. What do you think we should do? Well, I wanna build a uniquely American nuclear industry. People often point to France and other countries, and I don't have anything against how France or China or Russia or any other country does it. They should do their thing. But that's not how I think we should do it. I think, that we need to build an, a nuclear industry that is different. I think of nuclear energy sort of in nuclear energy reforms in three baskets. I look at the Department of Energy role, regulation, and nuclear waste. So let's start with the DOE. Now, I want to be clear this has nothing to do with anyone out there personally, nothing at all. It has everything to do with the nature of government. We need to get the Department of Energy out of the commercialization piece of the nuclear business. Totally out. As I said earlier, nothing. No grants, no demonstrations, no loans, no work on better fuels or better manufacturing techniques. These are all things government is currently doing. They're all things that industry should be doing, not because of some ideological preference, but because industry does these things better. They do it better than government ever could. Doesn't mean that the Department of Energy doesn't do anything nuclear. Sure can do research and maybe even build things like test reactors that the private sector can pay to use, but it needs us get we need to get it as far away from the commercialization uh, piece as possible. Now let's talk a little bit about regulation. I agree with what a lot of folks often put forth in discussions like this. We need to get part 53 right, which is the new regulatory process for small modular reactors. We need to get costs under control. Make sure the chairman of the NRC is pushing the bureaucracy to move things along. We need the our regulation to be risk-informed. All that's good. But none of that gets us where I think we should be. Now, I don't have all the answers on this part, but I do have some ideas I'd like to throw out, to the, throw out on the table. We need to allow states to take over all or some element of nuclear regulation. That doesn't mean every state will take it on, but at least it should be an option. This would create competition and push responsibility to the lower levels of government. Maybe let states regulate light water reactors and the NRC focus on new reactor technologies. We've literally been safely operating large light water reactors for over 50 years. States could take some of that over. And that brings me to point number two. Why in the world are we still regulating large light water reactors like they're this new scary technology? They're neither new nor scary. And again, let's lighten up on the light water reactor regulation and focus more on the new stuff. Now, how about some regulatory competition? What makes the people at NRC so special that they are the only ones that can review permit applications and other regulatory review work? Let private firms can compete for that business. I assure you they will pop up and they would do a quicker job for less money than any government agency. This could be done and at least it should be an option. And then the last idea I'll throw out there, what if firms were allowed to forego Price-Anderson protection, which is the, liab the government-run liability uh, framework that commercial nuclear energy falls under? What if, we for what if firms were allowed to forego that government backstop and replace it with some sort of, its, of insurance or liability requirements and therefore be relieved of a heavy regulatory burden? In other words, they're relieved of the regulatory burden, but they have to go out and find their own insurance. People say that can't happen. No one will insure a reactor, they say. Won't they? I don't know, but let's find out. And given the size of these companies and some of the people involved, maybe self-insurance is an option. I don't know what will necessarily work, but I think it's time to find out if there are other options out there. Now, the last thing I'll bring up is nuclear waste management. I'll save this for last because I think it's the, the most important thing. 
I think that like these other elements of nuclear energy, the federal government has done uh, a disservice to the nuclear industry by taking control of nuclear waste management, notwithstanding the good work of the people in the DOE and their efforts over the years. But the fact of the matter is government is not the right entity to manage nuclear waste. The United States made a huge mistake in my estimation in 1982 when it passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and took that responsibility away from the waste, uh, the waste producers, the utilities, and gave it to the federal government. We need to reform that whole process. I think in order for nuclear energy ultimately to be successful in a competitive economical way, we need to put the waste producers back in charge of waste management. That's for a couple of reasons. One, I just don't think the federal government will ever get it done. There are too many political issues with it. Um, it always is gonna cost too much. There are always changes in politics and administrations. And no matter how good the plan is, these things are always open to uh, to, 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 to political, um, different political pressures. But there's a second more important reason. What it does, whenever, you, whenever we took the federal government, whenever we made the federal government responsible for nuclear waste, waste management, we, break, we broke apart the fuel cycle. In other words, we took away the incentive for the private sector to invest in and develop a comprehensive fuel cycle that takes it into account um, everything from producing the fuel to managing the fuel. And putting that back into the private sector will ultimately be what I think drives new reactor technologies because the the the, the waste stream is dependent on the, the reactor that's being used. It also will create the incentive to develop reactors that can help manage existing nuclear waste. So I think that putting the private sector back in charge of nuclear waste management can help ultimately solve the, the the issues that are lying out there. And I just want to say one quick word on consent uh, on on the consent process on nuclear waste. Again, this has nothing to do with the good work that people at DOE are doing. I know that they're doing a great job and they're committed to it. But so long as you have a government entity trying to for to 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 determine consent, it's not really consent. Where consent is found is in the free market, where you have people who need something done. And they're, they are negotiating a free will with people who can do it. That's how true consent will ultimately be formed and lasting consent on things like how to manage nuclear waste will ultimately be found. So in conclusion, I just want to say that looking, we, we can't predict the future, but we can look at what has worked in the past and what has not worked in the past. And what we see is that these big government programs that try to push commer commercialization, we've been trying them for decades, they just don't work. What I'm proposing is something a little bit different. I think that by putting nuclear energy squarely into the private sector, we might have a chance of it emerging as a truly innovative, competitive, um, and sustainable energy source. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to talk about this. Thank you, Jack. Thanks so much for giving us like another perspective of things. I think it's very important to hear all the views. So uh, we have a couple of questions. We have a, a, a few, quite a few questions, actually. And um, I think I would like to start with a question for Nobuo. Um, you mentioned uh, current, so you mentioned the importance of international cooperation, right? When it comes to um, versatile reactor submarines and denuking North Korea. Um, the question is, are there any current initiatives going on or how would you see that this can come about to have that negotiation? I think that would be interesting to know for our audience. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, international collaboration in the nuclear sector is always there. Um, uh, in, in the IAEA or in, uh, in NEA or in bilateral, and the nuclear industry are very close together. Nuclear engineers working very closely. Um, so collaboration is uh, there. But unfortunately, I mentioned about this Japan, US, and Korea collaboration because after Camp David, the meeting of these uh, presidents and prime ministers. I think, uh, you know, particularly uh, geopolitics in the Northeast Asia is very much threatening. So I think uh, three countries should take much more proactive nuclear policy in terms of technology, in terms of uh, proliferation risk uh, abuse, and uh, creating the uh, kind of deterrence 
against North Korea, China, and Russia. And so I think this is a new idea, which I promote here for the sake of uh, 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 energy, uh, nuclear security, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Jack mentioned about the market should uh, take care of basically the development of commercial uh, uh, reactors. I, I cannot agree more, but the problem of the nuclear is the risk of proliferation for the weapon. So how can we stop that risk is definitely the, 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 the government's role and the international collaboration of making the, the risk as small as possible is necessary. Otherwise, uh, 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 you know, uh, it's always possible that like uh, the next country in the North Korea type may appear. In, in Saudi Arabia, it's always saying that if Iran has a weapon, Saudi Arabia will have a weapon. So how can we stop the cascading of the weapon weaponization in countries? So this risk is is imminent, and I think uh, uh, that, that, that we. Uh, really considered how can we reduce the risk of, uh, uh, of the weapon be pre, uh, pre, uh, uh, prevailing is, is the current uh, situation. So I think uh, uh, nuclear technology should be utilized for the peaceful use and we need the very big international uh, framework uh, sh should be, uh, in a way, modified uh, to fit the current geopolitical situation. That is uh, the, what we need most at this moment. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we have another question um, from Kenneth Austin, who is asking, what is the purpose of making nuclear flexible so that it can back up intermittent power? intermittent power cannot work on its own without backup power. Does it save money to keep nuclear in standby mode right, rather than running it? Or is the real goal not preventing climate change, but subsidizing wind and solar? <laughs> so I don't know who wants to answer this question, this long question. I'll take it. Should I check? <laughs> Good. Okay, should, I, should I go? Yes. I'll just say real quick, I think that a big part of of the current energy uh, discussion, at least in the United States, I think Europe as well, I, I'm hesitate to, 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 to talk about other countries, um, is to subsidize certain energy sources. Look, putting aside my thoughts on CO2, um, the fact of the matter is, if we really wanted to reduce CO2, the government wouldn't get involved in technology choices. They would set the regulatory they would choose whatever regulatory approach they were going to do, set it, and allow the market to best meet that that goal. Whenever the government starts getting involved in micromanaging and everything, uh, you know that something uh, strange is afoot. So yes, it absolutely is about subsidizing certain energy sources. In terms of intermittency, um, nuclear power as currently deployed isn't good at being intermittent or very flexible, but new technologies very much are. So I think that what you would see if the government would get out of the way and allow whatever carbon profile emerge to emerge, you would see an integration of different sorts of energy sources and different sorts of technologies be deployed in ways that work together. Um, but the people who produce and distribute the energy should be the ones making the, those decisions, not people at the Department of Energy or the EPA, in my view. Thanks, Jack. So I have one more question also to the panel, which, you know, we saw um, Erica's um, presented the, the, the framework that is used for consent-based siting, um, just thinking about just the framework and thinking about Europe. And, and we heard like that in Europe, you know, a lot, in a lot of countries in the population, nuclear is not so popular, mainly because spent nuclear fuel issues, right? Um, so, you know, the framework, would it be something that could be used to increase the acceptability for new generation um, nuclear reactors. It looks like something very tempting to, you know, to get closer to the communities, basically explaining, mm -hmm. you know, we won't have the huge issue of spent nuclear fuel anymore, um, which, which especially in Germany is, is like, there's a lot of NIMBY, not in my backyard, 
thinking and in Austria it's not popular at all, at all also so yeah I don't know who wants to answer this question Maybe. yeah well I well so. George if, uh, yeah well, I mean I, I think uh, uh, United States has a technology to take care of the waste much easier because rather than uh, put that spent fuel uh, go through the waste and such uh, you know just to take out the minor actinide together with plutonium and burn in the fast reactor this is the Idaho National Laboratories I uh, closed the uh, process so this will make uh, the, the, the minimize the risk of terrorist seizure of, of the plutonium because it's a closed system and uh, you know, uh, and and the waste is much much smaller in the volume and the toxicity. So this is the way to convince the public that maybe radioactive waste is manageable. So so that's the reason why I just want the U.S. take more serious about the commercialization of this integral fast reactor and uh, Japan has a special reason uh, we need it to, to take care of the Fukushima as uh, you know uh, meltdown debris and uh, we don't have the spaces like the United States to 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 to, to uh, dispose the waste so to reduce the toxicity and volume is very serious uh, uh, condition for Japan to, to to use the nuclear power so I think uh, Japan, US, uh, and also Korea, which is interested in this technology, should work together to uh, show the new model, the future model of the nuclear power. That is the uh, very important elements uh, to succeed in the future. And, and it's not only the power generation, the industrial use, the chemical, the Dow chemical is trying to use, Microsoft may use it for the data center, so this kind of industrial use of small or uh, micro reactor is very, very important uh, element for the nuclear uh, use for the future. Thank you, Nobuo. So we're going a little bit over the hour, but that's okay. I, I will take one more question. Um, and that is from David O'Keefe. He's asking for Jack Spencer. I'm wondering about how to square the proposition that the U.S. government should get out of nuclear technology development with the critical role the U.S. government played in launching the commercial nuclear industry, starting with naval reactors. Is there something unique about advanced reactors that lends itself to a purely private sector driven model of development and deployment? I think that's for Jack or and, and Georg, maybe. So go ahead, please. Yeah, I would just say um, whoever wants to answer. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, I, there's nothing unique about about advanced reactors that make it that position the private sector to do it better or worse. I I am arguing that if we want a innovative, sustainable nuclear industry, it has to emerge out of the private sector, and that government efforts to do so will fail. That's my base. That's my argument. Now. The, the 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 question brings up an important point. What about uh, the emergence of nuclear out of the Navy nuclear program? I agree with that. What government does really well is develop things that it needs to advance its interests, which Rick over needed a reactor, uh, a nuclear submarine, and then al allow that thing to be spun off into commercial enterprises when the promise is there. So almost all the nuclear technologies we have at their base at at, at the base, were developed in federal la in government labs. So I'm not saying government has no role. I'm saying in that commercialization process, government should have no role. Um, so that, that's sort of where I where I would leave. Anyone else wants to say something about this? If no, not, I think. Sorry, oh. go ahead. No, of course, uh, as I mentioned already, the, the industry in Europe says we cannot invest into nuclear power if it is expensive as it is today. So as we know, if the uh, private sector would start to develop new types of nuclear reactor, they will probably be cheaper. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. First, you have to check whether there is an option about that, uh, that the technology is, has the potential to become cheaper. I don't know whether the idea of uh, uh, Wolfgang Seifritz uh, would make this technology cheaper, but uh, I, I would not surprise if, if if yes, yeah, we can do it in a different way. 
And uh, also with the nuclear waste, uh, Wolfgang Seifritz has a different idea how to deal with nuclear waste. He say he, he builds a nuclear reactor in such a way that you fill once in the life of the reactor the nuclear inventory. And then when the fuel is uh, burned, then you dump the whole reactor after 30 years somewhere in an underground site. So that is a different approach to uh, to to uh, uh, to make the things cheaper. It's uh, I don't know whether it will work or not. I'm not the engineer to to dis discuss yes. all these details. But uh, the the idea is I would agree with Jack. If we have the option to make things cheaper, the only one who can do it is the industry. Any final word? Any final word from the from our panel? If not, I will hand it. Over. I will thank you all so much for being here today. I'm honored to have moderated this webinar with such um, eloquent speakers, and um, I'm handing it over to Rebecca from IAEE to close us out. Thank you so much. IAEE would like to thank Isabella and all of our speakers for a truly outstanding webinar. This webinar will be available on IAEE's website for future download. If you're not a member, we encourage you to join by visiting www.iaee.org. We thank you for attending, and I officially close this webinar. <laughs>